So, recording is started for the April 22nd, or March 22nd, review session. So, Doc, I'll let Dr. Kelly start off. He's going to talk about some of the stuff he has to cover, and then we'll just kind of work down through the list. Okay, so, <clears throat> arthrokinematics and osteokinematics, what is the, is the question? Is rolling glides, all that? Is that the problem? Okay, <clears throat> let's start off. Okay, so if the All right, if our moving surface is okay, then the okay, so got the two surfaces, right? Concave, convex. If the concave surface is moving, which way is the glide going to go? Oh, I wrote concave twice. Okay, so concave moves, you go the same side. All right. So convex moves, opposite side. Okay, so we'll get that down. That's the basic. Okay, so um, you cannot go just by the joint. And I looked at the books. Uh, some of them are, it's kind of confusing the way that they write them. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you can't just go by a joint. You can't just say the tibial femoral joint has the con convex concave rule is this way, because it depends on what bone is moving. So just, we'll take our knee here. So the tibial surface, convex or concave? Concave. Concave versus the convex femur. Okay, so that part, I don't remember which book it had, which one it is, I think maybe even both of them, no, score builders, tells you the convex concave surface, and that's always true, that doesn't change. What does change is the glide based on which one of these bones is moving. Okay, so if I've got, if you're seated, like you guys all are, and you're gonna do a seated leg raise, just leg extension, Right, so that's just my tibia moving. So which way is the roll first? Or is that the confusing part? Okay, so the way to think about this is if you were just gonna roll a bone without a glide and it falls off the body, which way would it fall off? That's the way you would figure out your roll. Okay, so you're, we're sitting here and if I were just to, if I just had this bone here and I just roll the bone and there's no glide at all to keep it in the joint, I roll it, it's gonna roll off anterior side of the bone, right? It's an anterior roll, okay? Don't, don't keep it in the same spot and pivot and be like, well, it's gonna fall off the posterior side. That's a glide, you're gliding it to keep it there. Just, just roll the whole bone, which, where's it gonna go? Anterior of the bone, okay, that goes anywhere. So if I take, if I take a scapula and do the same thing, if I were just to roll this bone up, which, which roll is this? It's a superior roll, because it would fall off the superior side of the bone, not the anterior side of the bone, not posterior. If you just roll the bone with no glide, which way is it gonna fall off? That's your roll. Then you just go with your rule. So yes, you have to know the surfaces, your joint surfaces. And again, score builders, um, page 103. So there on page 103, it tells you the convex surfaces. It gives you a bunch of the joints for upper and lower extremity. And so those are good. What I would stay, I would stay away from their last column, the opposite versus same motion. It's it's true, but the way that they write it is 
gets confusing. Um, just because you have a glenar humeral joint does not always mean they're going to be uh, opposite in... Well, it does for the motion, but if you're talking about the reversal of muscle action or the opposite motion, so typically our, um, like our flexion, shoulder flexion is going to be usually moving our arm. But you can do a push-up or something where your arm is stable and your body's moving. Okay, so don't get confused by that kind of stuff. So they're just talking about the motions um, based off of the roll. So once you get your roll, you should be able to name it. So is there, are there any questions left on that? You might have to just go through your joints and make sure you know the surfaces and then make sure you know which one is moving. So whatever activity they're talking about in your test question, you have to know which one of those joint surfaces, well, the joint surface is moving, which one of the bones osteochematically is moving. That's where you name it off of. Okay, don't just automatically assume the knee, femur, convex, you have to know which bone is moving. Okay? But the rules, there's no change in the rule. The rule will apply no matter what. The only thing that changes is which one you apply, depending on which bone's moving. Okay? Same for like shoulder flexion, because I know we talked about that that was spin, but I know that there was a question in, I don't know, one of these that talked about shoulder flexion in a way that I never heard of it. So, so it, your sources, what are they? They just say opposite, don't they? They don't say really. So the, it de it really depends on your on your source. I mean, I, I I do I call that a spin. Your your axis point is going through the bone, right through the joint. So, but if they were to, and now I just have to guess though if they're if they're calling it. That'd be a, I, don't know, I don't even know which way that would be. I mean, it makes sense for external internal rotation, which way it would be a glide. It makes sense for uh, abduction, but I don't know how you would, I don't even know what they would call it for flexion extension. I mean, if they, if they don't call it spin. Can so you do external rotation? That would be. Yeah, so external rotation, if I were just, so if I were to take external rotation, if I were just to flip this thing and spin it off, it's a posterior roll, and so my convex surface is moving, so it's an anterior glide. Can you explain what the femur and why is it called a femur roll? So. If you're doing knee extension, the one you were doing just takes the feet like. Mm -hmm. So, okay, it might be easier if I do it from standing. If we do it standing and I move the tibia, so either way, if I'm here or if I'm here, the tibia is still moving this way, right? So if I'm here and I move the tibia and I just roll it, it that's, it's coming off the front. So, yeah, it starts here when I'm sitting, but the motion of the tibia is the same. So if I were just to keep going on that, it's off, it comes off the anterior side, so it's, it's moving anteriorly. With, and not if the tibia is moving. Right, because concave is the same. So I, I'll, I'll show you slowly. So if I, were, if, if I were, in this case, if I were just to do the roll without the glide, it would start here, right? So I'm getting a big gap here. So in order to keep that, that contact, I have to roll and slide. Roll and slide. Roll and slide. So it keeps there. Okay, if it's the opposite one that's moving, if I were to go the same direction, if I were to roll and slide, roll and slide, roll and slide, that doesn't work. But when I roll, I slide posteriorly. I roll anterior, slide posterior, roll anterior, and you're right there. So that's why it depends on which bone is moving. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. Burn splinting or splinting in general. Um, 
I need to know the question on this one because you're, I know you're, neither book covers it very well, no. or even like the one half of one page is on splinting in general. So what are you guys seeing out there? Because we, one of the comments that we got was, I missed a lot of that. How much are you seeing on burns and burn splinting? A lot. It's actually a lot of burns. Mm -hmm. You would be so proud. <laughs> I think like, the confusion, oh, sorry. The confusion is, in general, I guess, you want to stretch the, like keep it in a stretch position that's not going to be a contracture. Mm -hmm. And the contracture pattern, I guess, is confusing. But also, it's like, if you get burned here, they want you here. Yeah. Yeah. The airplane splint, if you get burned your neck, they want you like this, if you get burned on the dorsal side of your side forearm, yeah. the you flex the fingers, the yeah. foot extended, yeah, the slide neutral slide position, slide. yeah, all that was hard. Okay. Oh yeah, for the foot slight dorsal flexion, if you have a plant like on your calf, I guess there's no like general rule of the problem. All right. <laughs> so your your therapy ed book has one. Come on, page one ninety eight. It's got one one little sentence that. <laughs> uh, actually can and should drive your decision making for all of these. Okay, so uh, under, so the second column under rehabilitation, just number one. <coughs> Overall goal is to limit loss of range of motion to prevent or reduce the complications of immobilization through positioning and splinting, reduce edema, provide emotional support. Emotional support's huge. But um, yes, the idea is that you are, you're trying to eliminate any contracture, but you don't need to stretch what doesn't need to be stretched. So when they're talking about doing this versus doing this, if there's nothing going on on my elbow, there's no need to go way out here and have these big old things, right? But if there is something on my elbow, yeah, I need to get out there. Anytime you have any burning anywhere where there's a joint, they want you to stretch it. Does it have to be maximal? No, but the last thing you want is for them to start relaxing, like the neck, you say they want an extension. That's because typically when, when we, even when we're just sitting upright, our, we're, we're pretty close to touching, right? And some people, if they have larger chins, will be touching. And the last thing you want is for that tissue to start to kind of meld together and have a contraction. So yeah, they're gonna be way in extension. So just think, think where the burn is, anterior, posterior side, on a joint, and you have to splint the opposite. You need to keep them stretched out so that when they start to get scar tissue, that scar tissue is gonna pull anyway. So they're already in an uphill battle. But your splinting should help them avoid any unnecessary contractures. Okay, so then we just have to deal with the skin. But that can be helped when you keep the skin straight, then that helps avoid any of those contractures as well. Okay, so. Take the, the example, you're thinking of your forearm, all right? So I've got my muscles on my forearm. If I keep my fingers extended, what happens when this all scars down? Now it's gonna be hard for me to try and move my hand, right? So you put that in an extended spot, extended meaning from wherever it is, whether it's flexion extension, you're just extending the tendons wherever they are gonna be damaged, right? So I'm gonna keep this down so that when this scars down, I can still move it. I'm not, I'm not locked here because now these are shortened tendons. Okay, so the idea is whatever tissues are involved, you get them stretched out so that when it scars down, if there's any limited limitation in mobility, they've already got a lot of it. You've, you've allowed that to stay useful for them. Okay, so really wherever the burns are, just think about the tissues that might be involved in that area of the body and how are you gonna protect them. That's where you put the splints or the braces. But by all means, if you come across questions like from here, I want to see them because those are new. They haven't really emphasized burn splinting before. 
So we didn't really talk about it in school. So shoot me the questions if you found if you find them. Yeah, I, I want to see what they're talking about. Yeah, if you can find it now, then we can walk through it. And I mean, I know you see the answers, but at least we can walk through the logic. Well, 453 in Scoreboard does have a, a recommended splinting for Burns. Splitting questions or those the ones you're remembering? But they're sticking out because I have okay. no idea what to do. Yeah, that's and that's common. That's why I was asking that. Because the ones we don't know are the ones that stick in our head. Okay, so huh, this one, this one has ne less necessarily to do with splinting for splinting's sake. Um, there's there's a key phrase in this question that you need to really hang on to. Functional? What? Functional? Yeah, they want to their their forearm is being fitted with resting splint to support the wrists and hands in a functional position. So what's the functional position? We've talked about. Uh, tenosynovitis and tenodesis and how they can use people can use extension to flex their arm okay so that's this is a functional position it's it's not straight on like that so a little bit of extension is a functional position with your fingers obviously if your fingers are fused together that's not going to be very functional but that's the difference with this question that functional position is what you've got to hone in on so uh, score builders, page 790, question 113, has a splinting question. That's the only splinting question that they have on Burns and all the score builders. Okay, so just going by that, just going by that principle again. I know you guys see the answer on this now, but can you see why those two options make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, you don't want to do a reflection. That's you're just asking for a contraction. Right, so A and B are gone right away. So pronation versus supination, same sort of deal. I mean, it's not as likely for sure, but if you do scar down and we lose mobility in there, 
I don't want to be like this the whole time, right? Or have difficulty coming out of that, right? So it's just leaving the hand functional position or anatomical position. So just going by that principle, just try and keep any kind of contracture out. So uncross your bones, open them up. Oh yeah, so 615 in therapy is another one. <coughs> that one we kind of talked about. Same thing, you're trying to avoid contractures, right? So chin tucked is no. That's gone, for sure. <laughs> Patient with deep anterior or partial thickness wound, the anterior neck is being tre treated for positioning. <coughs> Excuse me. Positioning. Most appropriate position for this patient, chin tuck, no. Chin forward, that's not really doing much, and that's not really functional. Are they going to stay that way? Mm -mm. Not so much. Now, hyperextension, remember my issue with the kinesiology book? It called anything past the zero hyperextension, right? So don't don't think that you're at... Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> no, it's... But it, it's not going to be to their end range, but it will be uncomfortable. I mean, we don't live in extension, but you've got to put them there. Otherwise, I don't want this to be it. I want to be able to do this, right? So what, when you splint somebody, you need to think about the end range. What do you want them to end up having? If they get locked down where you splint them, what's that going to look like? So if I don't do anything and it's here, what is that going to look like if I want to look at the ceiling? That doesn't work so well. So you put them here and they're like, this is awesome for six weeks. And then they get them out of there, and then now they can move. Okay, so think about the end game. Like, why are we doing this? It's for the end range when they're done. That's what we want to preserve. Okay, so yeah, hyperextension may be a little awkward at first, but uh, it, the idea is that a year, two years, ten years out, they can still look up, and they didn't lose that because of the way we split. So if it was like just doing your neck, it would be like flexion. yeah, yeah, you'd want them to flex them. Okay. Yeah. Just think, you want to stretch the side of whatever joint is affected. So that other one that was anti-cubital, or the cubital? Is it cubital or anti-cubital? Let's mm -hmm. just say cubital. It's cubital. Cubital. Yeah. On the cubital area. Cubital is the back. Well, that's what, that's what makes me wonder. If their answer is put it in extension, then they're just talking cubital area being the whole elbow. Okay, I think that's what we're getting here. That could be, because we taught anti-cubital. Yeah, so cubital area. So I put this. Yeah, so they're literally talking about the area where you take the cubital basso. That was 790, by the way. I feel like don't look at it again. Yeah, but that's, no, our, our issue is the use of the term cubital. I know, but I think that, I think that the better, better word is cubital fossa. I think literally what it's, with that one, what it's saying was with that question, it's not even the cubal area is not even the concern. It's saying a burn of the elbow. I think so. The traditional or contraction pattern of the elbow is into flexion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it's saying. I mean, the cubital is kind of maybe not the best choice there. 
but I think it's just saying that it's a burn of the elbow, so the t traditional pattern, when you're looking at traditional pattern of contractures of the elbow, is going to be in the flexion. So that you've got to go the opposite in order to get it uncontracted. Yeah, because your paragraph, your explanation, is the elbow is most susceptible to a flexion contracture. You're not going to get an extension contracture at the elbow. It, it locks out, and that's it. So... Um, yeah, I don't like that term though. I don't like cubital there. So, clunk is gone. All right. Does that make sense for splinting and stuff like that? Anything else in splinting? What's a cock up splint usually? Sleep um, at night. <laughs> the wrist? The wrist cock up splints for people that have what type of condition? Um, Carpal tunnel. tunnel. But there's something else too that we're talking about. Probably decrovanes. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with the thumb. Or not deep veins. I'm sorry. Um. Uh, 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 what's that contracture called? The core veins. What? No. Which one? I don't know. Um. It's not swan neck. Like I know what I'm thinking of the contracture where the the finger flexors are tightening down. Trigger finger. Not trigger finger. Oh my gosh. I'm drawing a blank on it right now. I'll think about it then. But boutonnieres, there we go. Thank you. That was what I was looking for. So cock up, we use frequent boutonnieres. Well, that's a hand therapy one. It's just pretty much anytime we're doing cock up, we're going to extension. Whether it's fingers, or whether it's wrist. What that'll do is that'll stretch us out so that you're not stuck here and you can't extend your fingers. Right? But why would we maybe not use a cock up splint? What patients? If we want to get what in the hand? Yeah, tenodesis, right? So we wouldn't. So this is going to prevent a tenodesis grip, right? A cock up splint is going to prevent a tenodesis grip. But if we were going for a tenodesis grip, we're not going to splint them into a cock up splint because we want the hand to contract down so that when they extend, they can grab. Is that that's the studying for hand therapy, so that's why. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm hoping somebody prepared for their hand therapy exam, so I've had to deal with these. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't think of what that was called. <laughs> it was getting my head. I also had a cleaning background. I appreciate it. Love it. That's why we all work well together. Okay, anything else on splinting? What? Oh, we're done. Okay. Um, special tests. What about them? I mean, that's, the, wait, wait, I know, I know it's hard to remember it, but what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> I already took my test, guys. Like, you got to put the time in. If there's confusing ones that you don't know how they run, that's fine. But that's what I mean. Like, what, what about them? Like, page 95 to 102 in Score Builders. Can we do a thing? Can we do it? And what I would say, guys, also, there are dozens of therapy clinics and whatever else online that love to show these things. So any one of these tests, you can look them up online. But let's, let's look at your decisions. It's not designed for rotator cuff. So, I mean, even in score builders, they have it under biceps tendon. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. tested it's stable in the uh, okay. bicycle group. Yeah, this one's a 96. Jurgensen's and Speed's tests are pretty similar. Um, but go for it. Okay, 
Okay, so position sitting, 90 degrees of elbow flexion. That's your difference. So speeds test, you can see the picture is straight out. This one gives you 90 degrees of elbow flexion. Okay, so 90 degrees of elbow flexion, forearm is pronated, humerus, humerus is stabilized. So you're just going to push against, right, humerus is stabilized. So, and then all you're going to do, you have it on your forearm and on the bicipital groove, and they are directed to actively supinate and laterally rotate. So their motion is this. Okay, that's what you're fighting against. Okay, so you've got a hand here, bicipital group, because that's where your pain is, that's where your indicator is. Okay, so your hand is there and your hand is given the resistance. So there's your two hands. Okay, so they start pronated. And then just give them resistance, kind of distal forearm, and they'll come, yeah, they supinate and the supination you might be able to maybe do a little bit by the hand, right? But that's their motion. Positive sign you can't do something. Well, positive sign is going to be pain, right? Should tell you positive test indicated by pain or tenderness of bicipital groove may be indicative of bicipital tendonitis. So, but other than that, I mean, I don't, I don't want to seem standoffish or callous about this, but there's, you've got the uh, descriptions in here, pictures on half of them, um, and your therapy ed book tells you the test. What did I wrote the page on for that one? But that's pages 13 to 15, but uh, there's no descriptions at all. It, they give you the test, they give you what they're testing for. <clears throat> but uh, no, they don't tell you how to do it, anything like that. So, therapy or um, score builders is much better as far yeah, as. What are you guys running into on in questions for this? That's my question. Because that might, because as far as I'm aware, that you guys just have to know what the tests basically are. Yeah. So, like tunnels, you can do it anywhere, not just on the forearm. So, tunnels test for testing, yeah. yeah. The tapping test to see if you have nerve pain or nerve pain. Yeah, that's all. Tenels is typically on one specific nerve, but it can be done pretty much anywhere. Do you have any any specific questions on? Special tests like that? <laughs> yeah, so officially, Tenel's sign is a test designed to elicit tenderness over a neuroma of a nerve. It doesn't specifically say of the ulnar nerve, of the median nerve. It's just a neuroma on the nerve itself. Typically, the one we do is ulnar. That it for you? Yeah. No, do we have any specific questions about special tests that we can? Sorry, one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, there was one question that when, oh, on, in therapy ed 634, number 64. Negative numbers? Yeah. Really? This is saying that that just means you don't have to get in the knees for the foot. I would not guess that. I would not agree. I mean, I wrote a picture to Krista about about this question because I didn't realize that it's saying that you're not getting in the knees. It's not like where I would have gone. Just me. 
Yeah, um, I know this doesn't instill confidence in you, but I would have gotten that one wrong because I've never seen that. I even, when I, <clears throat> before I started teaching you guys that way, I talked to those who teach orthopedics at UNLV. Same thing, we're going to use negatives. Yeah. So, 634. <clears throat> Have you guys seen that in score builders? Are they using negative numbers too? Uh, no, but the white one, weird one. I see how this question is worded, and I see where it can get. Well, I think I got an answer for that one. Yeah, you can, you can drop the zero. Yeah. If the zero's in front, you can drop it all the time. If the zero's in the middle, you can't. You've got to keep it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, if that was the case, then it's just it's it's right documentation to drop the zero. You don't have to have it. I don't know if I'm following your question, but. Do you know the number? I think I understand this question the way they're asking. It's not a very good wording, but I understand what's asking. So I'll take a shot at it. Because I've seen one, I've saw one of these at the practice All right, let's see. Okay, so. If you're documenting your elbow range of motion, you can do. I think that's what confused me because they had that option as well. Okay. All right. So when the zero, when it's a leading zero, I meaning there's no numbers. Like if it were this way, okay, then I can't get rid of that zero. That's I'm using it. So this way, you know that past zero. This person's got a crazy amount of hyperextension, right? This is way extra, right? But this way, all I'm saying is that they're all in flexion, right? They're locked in 13 degrees of flexion here. So whether I have this or not, that doesn't really matter. So their actual range of motion is this, without the zero. Can I take a stab at the negative yeah. one? Well, so, because the only reason I've seen, a, I saw a question like this when we were doing, I was discussing with another colleague about this. I'm just going to go. So, what they're saying with that, that question you guys are having with the minus seven, so it says somebody that's at 25, it says 25 degrees and seven, minus seven degrees. What they're expecting you to know is that you should go plantar flexion, neutral, dorsiflexion. So what they're saying is they've got 25 degrees of plantar flexion and can only go up. They're short minus 7 degrees of ten, from neutral. So really, they're stuck kind of here. 25 to, what would that be? That'd be 3 to uh, 7, be 7 degrees. So they'd be stuck. They can't get to zero on neutral. So they're not going to have any dorsiflexion at all. That's how I was like that. So they're missing. They're actually missing. They can't get, they're missing seven actual degrees of dorsiflexion. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to say. Because they're just kind of expecting you to go here. I know that you should go plantar flexion, neutral dorsiflexion on that ankle. I don't like the way it's worded either, but I see what they're saying in it. They're basically saying the patient is missing yeah. degrees in the dorsiflexion. And that she should assume that plantar flexion is the first one. Is it always the first one? Plantar flexion, zero, dorsiflexion? 
that's the way I've seen it written. Um, <clears throat> Unless you're measuring just plantar flexion or measuring just dorsiflexion. Kind of on the same line as squinting, I think, is it this, so, um, in therapy and on page 614, number 31, I think squinting and positioning, are they, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Are the, do, you, do you follow similar rules? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So either one, you're trying to avoid contractures. I think it just gets confusing to me with the upper body. Well, let's think, so out of our choices here, because this is for spastic hemiparesis, right? If I'm going to go spastic, am I going to go this way or am I going to go this way? Yeah, because I'm always going to kind of go into what position eventually? Yeah, decorticate posturing or into fetal position. Right, so that's the position you want to avoid me in. Right, so when I'm looking down through there, abduction and laterally rotated are the ones I'm looking for. And then the question is, do you protract or retract the scapula? Well, I'm saying, that's, that's what I'm saying. Then you're down to, are you protracting or retracting oh. the scapula? Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So why, what would happen if you, you split me in this posture here? With a retracted scapula. What happens when I lay down? Yeah, I'm kind of. Well, I'm, I'm sitting at the camera angle, right? So if I if I if you split me into retraction with hemiparesis, right? I'm here because we, we're gonna re, we're gonna abduct and externally rotate to keep them from coming here. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. So we're out here. But if you retract my scapula and get me way back here, now can I lay flat? No, right? So that's going to affect the whole time I'm lying in bed. I'm like this, right? So you have to protract the scapula at least for that to keep them in a position they can lay flat. So it's a combination of knowing that what you have to look at is, okay, I'm going to end up here. I know I have to get the arm out here so it doesn't contract here. And then functionally, what place do you put the scapula in? Functionally, you're going to have to protract the scapula slightly to keep them so they can actually lie down. Another thing is you're kind of going to get this anyway. Typically with the scapula, when you get kind of spastic, it's going to pull back. What number was that? Uh, 614, number 31. Does that make sense for that one, though? No, that face didn't say so. So I'm kind of confused. Um, is the scapula protracted with the shoulder abducted? Yeah. And that is the You're going adduction there. Adduction? Yeah, you're going, ad, you're going adduction. Abducted is what the answer is. Okay. Abducted okay. and externally rotated. Okay. Because they're going to come here. Right? And oh, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, but again, think you have to include bed positioning. That's what I'm saying. You have to include bed positioning with it because you, you're not gonna you're not gonna leave the patient. This would be I, this would be the most ideal position you could put them in. Okay, I think maybe that's what I was right. This would be the most ideal position you could put them in here, right? Because that's gonna keep the spasm at the minimum. But if I, you put me in this position, I can't lie down. And if I have hemiphoresis, you know what, what position am I gonna spend most of my time in? Supine. Right? And so every so if I'm way back here, retracted, and I lie down, I can't get my back down 
where I can. So you have to protract the shoulder in that case, just for bed positioning. I didn't read the answer. I'm just kidding. So the first, so if I'm answering that question, the first thing I'm doing is thinking, what's my normal position of contracture of muscles? Right. Same for splinting with burns. If I have some sort of a contracture, what way is that joint gonna go? In this case, two joints, right? Because we kind of have the elbow involved. It doesn't even talk about the elbow in this question. Right? But we're going to eventually, all, every, whether it's a burn, whether it's spasm, we're all going to eventually go here. Right? Think of like an old person that's been sitting in bed for a long period of time. What do they look like? Right? They go back to fetal position into that decortical posturing. Does that make sense now? That face is great. I think this one also has to do with that previous question we read on splinting, how it said functional position. The fact that you're positioning a patient in bed has a lot to do with this versus right. just regular splinting. So you've got to take that into account in this question, whereas in other questions, another scenario, the third one might be the best option, yep. right? like he's saying. So just the fact that this question says you're positioning a patient in bed who has this hemiparesis, that's where you got to take that into effect, into account. Yeah. Yeah, but then you, you're adding stuff to the question too on top of adding pillows. Does that make sense to everyone? At least, sort of. All right. So upper extremity shoulder special test is done. Hormones and NTs. What question do we have on hormones and NTs? That's that, that's kind of a that was, I got like a question on that. But hormones on NTs. I okay. Study them. I don't know. It's sort of like the special test. I don't know. Are you running into specific questions on them? Because if I was if there's not a specific page in either of these books for hormones and NTs. If I'm looking at hormones and NTs, I'm going back to here. You guys have this book, right? Yeah. Doesn't this have an anatomy book you guys use? No. Do so you use the other one? Black. Oh, the black one? Okay, so I'm ahead of it. I'll have to look at the page. I'm, I forgot that we changed. Sorry, that was my, this is the book I looked in. But look in your anatomy book, because your anatomy books have the hormones and NTs in them. That's your best place for them. But what's, so they're basically what? Hormones and NTs. Are they similar? They're both being secreted into the body to do what? Do stuff. <laughs> right? Where are your neurotransmitters primarily? Well, brain and in the, which system? The nervous system, right? In that postsynaptic clefts, right? And then your hormones are acting on what? Typically. The rest of kind of your body, your other hormone glands, stuff. Remember that from anatomy? Dr. Kelly covered all that fun stuff. Yeah, sure you do. When you're dealing with neurotransmitters, they can either be one or two things. They can either be, remember, we, we covered this in neuro, I know we did. What's that? Yep, yep, you got it. Inhibitory or excitatory, right? And if you have an inhibitory or neurotransmitter, that means there is a opposite neurotransmitter that opposes it, or at least works in the opposite fashion, right? Dopamine. Dopamine is what type of? Think about it. Dopamine, which disease? Parkinson's. What does a Parkinson's patient walk like? Fast. Right, so dopamine is an inhibitory chemical. Dopamine inhibits which chemical? Acetylcholine. Yeah, right? Because when acetylcholine's out of whack, they have which disorder? You remember that one? Myasthenia gravis. Right? But either of those patients can present what? A Parkinson's patient and a, a myasthenia gravis patient can present very similar. Because one is dopamine's not inhibiting acetylcholine, the other is acetylcholine's just out of whack. Right? So you kind of have to figure out, like, the epinephrine has an easy one, right? Epinephrine, what's the opposite of epinephrine? Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. <laughs> that one makes it easy for you, right? 
But that's kind of the basic one. So you, and then you have to figure out, is it a primary or a secondary neurotransmitter? Right? You know your primaries. Your secondary ones are like your NANC, catecholamines, and stuff like that. What kind of stuff are you looking at you're running into? That hormones or neurotransmitters are the problem? Because that kind of helps me a little bit to see if I, what I need to cover. I mean, is it that you're running into diseases and they're asking what the, prob what the neurotransmitter that the problem is? What? Somebody sent me that and don't even remember sending me that? Is that where we're at at this point? Okay, so no one's, no one's seen any NT questions. Because evidently I got like two emails about this. I don't remember who it was that sent me after you guys took your PEEP. So that's why I, I don't know if there's a question in the PEEP that specifically talked about NTs that was confusing. Well, yeah, so if you have Parkinson's, it's yeah. dopamine. If you have myasthenia gravis, it's acetylcholine, right? Muscular sclerosis. Trick question, it's not a neurotransmitter problem. <laughs> right? What's the problem in muscular sclerosis? The, the myelin. Yeah, right? The myelin's the problem. What develops myelin on the nerves? It also delivers ice cream around here occasionally. Yeah, what's the, what's the name of the ice cream? One of the ice cream trucks that delivered ice cream around town. Schwann's. Maybe they don't exist anymore. I know they exist on the East Coast. There's a few. Schwann's. What yellow trucks that say Schwann's on the side? Maybe. Okay, Dr. Chima at least. Uh, maybe. I'm, Henderson, okay. Maybe that's where I run into them. Yeah, so it's just your, when you talk about neurotransmitters, when you're talking about hormones, it's just knowing what you're talking about. With hormones, the main thing you have to know is where they're what? Yeah, where they're secreted at, right? And that kind of, and that's just the main. And there's not going to be a specific question that's going to say the anterior pituitary gland secretes one of these following hormones, right? It's going to say that the anterior pituitary is secreting this hormone. Where is? How does it act on the human body, or what disease might be affected by it, right? Adsens, all those fun ones like that. That's more of a patho question than it is an, an actual neurotransmitter or hormone question. So the only thing I can say there is, I would, if, I'm, if you want to review your hormones and neurotransmitters, go back to your anatomy book. I just happened to pull this one because this was the one sitting up there. I thought you guys still used this one. I think you guys were the first group that went to the black book. So at least Kevin saw it, so I feel better. There's a chart. Is there a chart in the book? 461. 461, which book? I didn't go over it. I must have missed that. Thank you. I looked everywhere for one of those. 461. Well, there you go. Look at that. Boom. Mic drop. Yeah, and then again, if you want something, if, again, remember guys, these are great. These books are fantastic. But go back to your source material too, right? All these books come from all the books that we teach you guys out of, right? So all the books we teach you out of, if you look at the back and you look at the index of where they're referencing, it's coming out of your green book, it's coming out of your big red, it's coming out of your, either this anatomy book or the new anatomy because they score, if FSVPT sends out a survey every to the two years, Dr. Chima, I think was for textbooks, and sees what books we're using and then bases the questions off those books. And then Score Builders goes and takes that survey and develops this. So if you're, you know, if, if you're having a problem and this doesn't have enough information, go, okay, where did I learn about hormones and neurotransmitters at? Oh, from Dr. Ciccatelli in anatomy, back to your anatomy book, you know, or we covered it in diseases and patho and then also in neuro, so it's going to be out of your big red as well. But that's about all. I mean, I, I, there is no way I could cover every single neurotransmitter and every single hormone other than just to take a look at them. All right, so I didn't know that chart. That is an excellent chart. Thank you very much. I did not, I could not find one to save my life when I was looking for it. Evidently, I did not look at the right spot. Did not save your life. Not save my life. I'm dead. <laughs> Tens I see pre mod. So those of you that asked this, what I'm going to say about this one is go back to that chart that Dr. Chima gave you. All right, but let's run through because I did this for you guys semester two. Right, let's run through it. You first of all have to determine if your patient is what. Chronic or acute, right? If they are chronic, let's start with acute, because acute's first, acute, right? Because you have a acute patient, ha uh ha. -huh. I always love that one. You have an acute patient, 
What pain control theory? Gate control. Good. So we have gate control theory. So then that means the next thing we have to determine is our frequency and our pulse width. Right? So what type of frequency do we want for gate control? High. Why? What are we trying to avoid? Contraction. Right? Because if we do this, a low frequency, we can get a contraction. If I'm going like that, can the muscle react? Right? The muscle can't react if you're beating that fast. Right? So you have a high frequency. Right? If you have a high frequency, what's your pulse width then you want to be? It's always inverse. Right? It's always opposite. Right? So if you have a high frequency, that means you have a low pulse width. That was your frowny face guy on your TENS unit. Remember? Some of you did that. You turned the knobs in. Oh, look. He's looking frowny. Because you have your knobs like this. Pulse width is in milliseconds. That's how long each of those pulses is hitting for, right? So it'd be really hard if you're hitting really fast to have really long pulses because it's hitting so fast, right? So that's in milliseconds where this is in what? Frequency is usually measured in either PPS or Hertz. And guess what? There's a secret. They're the same. If it's 10 PPSs, it's 10... Hertz, right? And we don't get into megahertz until we get a lot of pain. No? Get it? Megahertz. Oh. This is why you don't sit on in my classes. <laughs> this face says it. Right? So, so we go high frequency, low pulse width. That's for our acute patient, right? So let's go chronic then. Chronic then is going to be exactly. The opposite, but the first thing we have to figure out is pain control theory. Opiate release. Opiate release, right? Or what's the other term for it? Noxious, Noxious stimuli, right? Because, our, so remember, gate control, ow, my head hurts, right? You rub it to make it feel better. What's an example of the pain of the actual opiate release? My head hurts. This is the, this is the parent's treatment. So I'm going to stomp on your foot and you'll forget about your head because I'm going to cause you pain somewhere else, and that pain's going to override the other pain you have. Poor kid. <laughs> he explains a lot about me, doesn't it? But it's, that's, the way I, that's, why I, that's the way my instructor taught me back when I was, uh, you know, maybe I grew up in a rougher part of the area than you guys. But that's the whole theory, is you're causing pain to relieve pain. Right? You're hoping that the increased pain from the TENS unit beating, because right? some of you really did not like that TENS at chronic, when it was beating really hard. Right? Some of you giggled. <laughs> or some of you just giggled in general the whole time you were in the program. Right? JJ. Um, so, opiate release. Frequency then for chronic is low. Pulse width then would be high because we want it to hit for a long period of time. And remember, long period, I'm using in quotes because we're talking really, really, really small seconds. We're not talking seconds, we're talking microseconds, right? So it's not gonna hit for a long period of time, but we want it to hit for a longer period of time. So we get that muscle to get into tetany and get a little bit of a contraction going on, right? So last thing we have to know about these, right? If we have an acute patient that's using TENS, how long can they use TENS for? All day, 24 seven, right? Because we're not getting a Contraction, right? So we're just at that sensory level. They can walk around all day and rub their head, right? And make it feel better. It's not advised for them to run around smacking their leg off things all day long to get the pain to relieve in their head, right? Because <laughs> they're gonna need therapy somewhere else, right? But that, so then with chronic, how long can they wear it for? Max of 10, 20 minutes is usually our treatment. What's the max? 30. Right? Because after that, what could they develop? DOMS. Right? Because if they had that on for it, right? This is the patient that you send home with their TENS unit with chronic settings and comes back to you a week later and says, what? I'm sore. It's not working. It's not helping. And you ask, well, how long can you come in? You look, and the pads are still in the place that you put them on when they left the week before. Right? Well, I've been worried the whole time. I had to change the battery three times. Right? I speak around. I've had a patient like that before. Right? And what's happening is that whole time that muscle's just 
spasming and spasming. Oh, thank you, left hand. Spasming and spasming and spasming and spasming and spasming and spasming. And they're just going to hurt worse than after that, right? So does that help with at least the settings, right? What's the difference between TENS and IFC and pad placement? So TENS is eye formation, right? Football eye formation. Whereas IFC, X is going to give it to you, right? See, so you guys think it's silly, but you're going to sit on your test, and you're going to go IFC pad placement, X is going to give it to you. So, that, okay, good. That's what was the last thing I want to cover, because I, I saw a question on pre-mod, so I wanted to cover it. Okay, so pre-mod is also known as pre-modulated IFC. So you remember, we talked, Chima and I both talked about the difference between pre-mod and IFC. What's the main difference? The number of pads, right? IFC has how many? So pre-mod probably only has two, right? So it pre-modulates those two pads so that you can do IFC in a smaller area without smaller pads. Right? Ideally, you can do IFC everywhere as long as you have pads that you can get in the X formation. But like, you have somebody with like, Isabel's wrist back there. It's going to be really hard to get one-inch pads across her wrist or even, you know, even down to one-inch pads because she just has a really tiny wrist. I have a small wrist for that matter. Right? But I can do a two-pad pre-mod and get a pretty similar effect out of it. Right? So it's going to have the scan, it's going to have everything like that, right? So we have that. What is the other, so what is the other difference between IFC and TENS? IFC is what type of current? You have to plug it into the wall. Electric. Oh, it's all electrical. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of current do you get out of the wall? Direct. Other one. Uh -huh. Starts with A. Alternating current. That's IFC? Yeah, because you have to plug it into the wall. Right? It's, 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 yeah, but you, you never saw it's like 110 volt. No. Oh my gosh, really? Don't they teach you in school anymore? Like, I thought I taught in physics. Right? To be fair, oh, physics is a long time ago. Right? So we have to plug it into the wall. The other thing is tens is what compared to IFC? Smaller, and if it's smaller, that means it's, yeah, portable, right? Do you, 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 you imagine carrying that IFC machine around, like going to Starbucks, plugging it in, adjusting your settings, right? IFC is a little brick. It's a DC current. It right? comes right from the battery. It converts DC into a little bit of an alternating current, but it's prim primarily provided by a DC current versus alternating current. Tens, yes. And tens is pre-mod. Tens is not pre-mod. Pre-mod is its own thing. So you have, yeah, so you have IFC, right? And then you have pre-mod, which is, so pre-mod is nothing but pre-modulated IFC. Because this is a question, if you guys remember, in Dr. Ruskin's time treatments that got you guys. Because he said, put pre-mod on a patient, and almost every single one of you came to, you came to me when you guys were studying for that. What's pre-mod? And I went, I know we covered this. Go back to your modalities class. You're like, oh, yeah, pre-mod. If you look in your modalities book, it's listed as pre-modulated IFC. Right? It's just another setting on your machine. Right? It's just that this is four pads. Yeah, that other button. Exactly. That's two pads. Right? Does that make sense, though? So if you know your settings, either, either this face or that base on the TENS unit, you can figure out pretty much everything, right? Because frequency, and this goes from 15 to 300, something like that, pulses per second, or something like per second. Just whether it's a low or a high frequency, low or high pulse width, they're just inverse, right? So if you know that they're inverse of each other, as soon as you pick one, the other is the opposite, right? Does that help a little bit with those? Yeah. And then high volt, because I had a, somebody asked a real quick question on high volt. What's high volt used for? Oh, it's when you jump over poles, right? High volt? No. Okay. Oh, it's pole volt. I got confused again. 
I've heard it could be used for what? I mean, particularly what type of a problem that infections might cause or injuries might cause? Swelling. You can use it on ulcers too, right? Wound care. Right? Dr. Kelly talked about wound care in that one lecture he gave for Dr. Chima, right? And the other thing you can use it for is for swelling, for lymphedema. Right? What's that? So can you go to page 629? 629 in which? Therapy ed. Therapy ed. That kind of scares me. I can go there. I would like to prepare to advance, but sure. Sorry. Number 55. Number 55. Start that too. Physical therapist assistant reads a stated goal in the plan of care to stimulate de-enervated anterior tibialis, anterior muscles. Which of the following current is most appropriate? So is number four the same thing as neuro? Okay, so this is not, so this is, yeah, so we're doing NMES at this point, right? Yeah. But what did I also say about when you have de-enervated muscle? Is Easton really gonna be that effective? Why? Because it's not connected, right? You can take, the cadaver, if you take e and you pump it up enough volts into the muscle, guess what's going to happen? It's going to contract. Right? If you pump, if the cadaver is fresh enough and not dead for a long period of time, but the muscle fibers are still there, right? If this is de it's not getting a signal. So really, that, that's the first part of it. I don't like that question. Um, but if, so do you remember what the, so the answer is four, right? Uninterrupted direct current, monophasic current. So, Monophasic means what, first of all? Yeah, monophasic is typically a direct current, right? It's not doing this. Do you remember? What's that? Biphasic, right? Monophasic is hit off, hit off, hit. Is that going to fire a muscle? Yeah, right? So if I'm looking at this, two things I'm rolling, which two answers do you think I'm rolling out? Ten. Okay, okay, I'm rolling tens out right off the bat. Yeah, tens is gone. And then what? Number and then number one, why? I wouldn't even, well, biphasic would be, yeah, that'd be part of it. The other is AC, alternating current. I'm just rolling that kind of out as well, because I know that if I have to, kind of, I need a direct shot into that muscle. That's why I think direct current, I think direct shot. Yeah, but it converts it, right? There's conversions inside for certain, for specifically like your Russian and VMS. But I'm ruling out one and, but yeah, you could even go with the biphasic current, Kevin. That would be a good way of ruling out as well. Absolutely. So then I'm down to two and four. What's continuous direct current gonna do to a muscle? So I put a pad on here. What's continuous mean? It doesn't stop. So what am I, so let's just say it's my forearm extensors. I don't want to do my foot. Forearm extensors that you're putting it on. And you put me on continuous direct current. What is my wrist going to look like? Right? Am I going to get anything out of that at all? Other than what? A really, really sore muscle. Right? Because it's just it's constant. It's putting me into what? What's that term called there? I'm stuck way back here and it's just constantly firing. It's putting me into full technique. Right? I'm building, I'm doing nothing but building up lactic acid up here. There's no contraction, it's just a solid, straight on, hard line contraction. Where if I do interrupted, right? Don't you use that for iontophoresis? What do you mean? Do you use which? Continuous. continuous, yeah, you're gonna use continuous for iontophoresis, and Dr. Chima can always chime in if she wants as well for. Yeah, because this is the, the thing that I think is throwing you off on this question is the tissue is denervated. So under normal circumstances, if the tissue was innervated, you would do Russian, which is a biphasic, right. and you would do the on-off. So because it's denervated, what they're trying to do is stimulate that nerve by Forcing. going with interrupted direct, which is going to positive and send positive and negative charges to that uh, the uh, action potential, trying to get a nerve generated. That's so what it's trying to do. If it clinically, you can attempt to use this with your patients, but after two years, if you don't get any type of contraction, pretty much that nerve is not going to right. re-innervate. Right. Do you guys, have you ever seen the, the uh, direct current device for this in your clinics? Typically, they're like little yellow guns that has a dispersive pad that comes off of it. You put the dispersive pad on, you put it on the muscle, the muscle junction, 
and you push the button and it triggers a shot in. That's the direct current kind of muscle stim. I'm surprised none of you saw it. I, don't, I, I use it quite frequently. One. And this will have a positive and a negative electrode right. to it. Different than ionophoresis, where you've got it built into the uh, capsule where you put the medicine, and then you adjust the polarity right. accordingly. So this is a little bit different question. This is probably a tier three question. Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely deductive reasoning question. But yeah, so I would have it, the de-enervated I'm avoiding biphasic period, right? But I'd avoid tens because tens is for typically pain, right? The, the, by deducting which one would be correct, you wouldn't want the continuous direct because that's yeah. going to cause tissue burn yep. and damage to the tissue. I mean, think of ionophoresis. You know, you're only using it for. Uh, Amperage of four milligrams or milligrams for maximum 10 to 20 minutes. Yep. This is a this is a higher level question actually. Yeah. And there's another one I think which is why I'm going to do Kumon and Mom. What what page pistol? Um, page 661, 109. Six. In the other book or this book? Same one. 661, 109. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Reskin. Everyone say hi, Dr. Reskin. I'm just kidding. So 109, mm -hmm. patient is instructed to apply high rate transcutaneous electrical neuromuscular or nerve stimulation to low back to modulate chronic pain condition. Patient now states the, t the TENS unit is no longer effective at reducing pain in spite of, right? So this one I did talk about. So now what have they, what's, what's happening? Why is it not working? What have they done? Yep, what's the word? Start with an A. Adaptive? Close to adaptive, close to a custom. Uh, accommodated. Right, they've accommodated to the 10 settings you gave them. Right, but wouldn't, for chronic, wouldn't you want to do low rate? They're already on low rate. No, they're on high rate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're Yeah, so remember, the modulation was that switch. Remember the switch? P and M? Pre-mod is not a part of 10. Right. Pre-mod is IFC. Yeah. And modulated is the first one. Pre-mod is IFC. This is transcutaneous. Yeah, this is just straight 10s. This is that switch on the 10s the unit that was, remember it said P or B for burst, mm -hmm. N for normal, M for modulated. You know, what modulated makes is kind of a sweet function of the actual thing so it can overcome accommodation. Well, see, here's my thing. Here's, here's, okay, let me, I think I understand where, why that switch to low rate is not right, because the PT has ordered the patient to have high rate TENS at this point. Right? So you're instructed, a patient was instructed to apply high rate TENS. Right? Typically, though, we're going to use what with a chronic patient? Low rate. low rate TENS, right? But a patient was instructed to use high rate TENS. At that point, that's a PT order to use high rate TENS. We don't automatically change them. What would we have to do before we could change them to low rate tens? We would have to get clearance from the PT to change, because that's changing what? That's changing the plan of care. Yeah, so just remember, high rate is what? Is it the opioid or the state control? Right, so that's what you're dealing with. So sometimes you're gonna have to break it down, but we're just yeah. using gate control. Right. And a lot of times in chronic pain, that way they can wear the device. Yeah. Modulation. It's this switch here, right? Yeah, yeah. So remember, what do we use this for here? Which pain control theory? Because I did this on Don, and Don hated me. 
Burst, right? What does burst do? Remember I explained this basically? Burst takes everything you receive in three seconds and delivers it in one shot, right? So that means we're going to trigger what pain control theory? Noxious stimuli, right? So this is typically going to be your chronic accommodation factor, right? Over here, right, it's so a low rate. Over here, this is typically going to be acute, but in this case, he's using it 24-7, so that's probably why Dr. Chima's right. And that's typically your high rate accommodation. Because what modulated does, it's, so remember, so, mod, so when you're at a high rate, you have a high frequency. So you're going up to 240 hertz, I think, is the top on most of the TENS units. So modulated is going to take it and sweep it down to 190, back up to 240. Down to 210, back up to 240. And it's going to modulate it. That's going to make it harder for the muscle to, and the, the nerves to accommodate to it because they can't get used to one signal. Does that help? You thought, oh, oh it's good, yeah. Like well, then Dr. Hume's right. They're probably using, because he probably, so let's just say we have, let's say we have a patient that's a construction worker that has low back pain. He's not going to be able to go and put 20 minutes and sit there for 20 minutes with, you know, with low rate tens on while it, as people keep working. And you saw how what that low rate tens does to you. Can you really walk around and do your job while you're on? <laughs> it's not going to work out very well, right? But they can put this on, and at least it gives him some alleviation of pain. But what's happening is because he's so chronic, he's accommodating to that high rate pretty quick. So there's a couple of different ways. I would just look at it that if the PT said high rate, I'm not, I can't change the low rate without getting clearance. Yeah. I just saw instructed and that kind of... Mom told him to do it. Yeah, exactly. Does that make sense, though, for pre-mod, IFC, TENS, any other? Are we okay with that, right? And we covered uh, IONTO and all that other stuff last time, right? All right, Whew, got through that. Postural drainage. Did we actually get a lot of questions on this? I think Paige was the one that asked me on this, but I think somebody else followed up then and said, post one. What? Okay. Yeah. Tiny question. Uh-oh. Well, we have tiny dancer, so why not tiny question? Sure. The IFC, you can't cross the spine. Yes, IFC, you can. You can cross. Yeah. It's tens, you can. Tens, you can't. You shouldn't. You can. It's not. So here's it. You cross the spine with tens. It's not going to kill them. It's going to be uncomfortable. Why? Why is IFC less uncomfortable? Because it's got the scan. It's got that scan and sweep, right? So it's a little less uncomfortable. Whereas tens is kind of really bitey a little bit across the spine. But yeah, you can cross, I see across spine, absolutely. All right, so okay then? Yeah. Little question answered? Okay, tiny question. All right, so then back to postural drainage. So you had four questions on it. When you're doing postural drainage, there's one key thing you gotta think about. Was it the positioning that got you guys, or what was it that got you? Positioning? So positioning, your answer for positioning is just knowing what lobe you're draining. Yeah, and so in order to know that, you have to know the position of the lobes of the lung. That's it. If you don't know where the lobes are, you can't position them, right? If you're hitting the lower lobes, you probably want them in what type of a position? You want them to Trudelberg like this? What? Yeah, we want them face, head going down some way, whether it's face down, face up, whatever it is. We want their head down because we want the stuff to get up into the more up your upper bronchioles, right? If we have a right-sided postural drainage and any of the other lobes, what are we probably going to want them in? Side lying on left side in some way, right? And then it's just figuring out which way is best to get out of that lobe. So you just have to visualize, if you get a, if you get a postural drainage question, draw a lung. Quick draw a lung. Oh, this is what I'm talking about. So this is down here. So if I want to get it, I've got to put them like that to get it out, right? That's the best example. Like, I mean, other than memorizing every single one of the postural drainage positions, which uh, postural drainage for it was on page score builders 388, therapy ed 172. I mean, other than knowing every single posture, I would just literally, and don't make fun of me for my lung, Right? Draw my lung. That's a lung. That's, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lung. 
This is why I don't take art class. Draw a lung, draw the thing I'm doing it in, and then think of what position I have to put them in to drain it. Does that make sense? What kind of conditions are we going to deal with this in? COPD, maybe. Cystic fibrosis is the big one, right? Yeah, so if you get a question, it's probably going to be say, you have a 13-year-old patient with cystic fibrosis that has excessive drainage in the lower right lobe. Right? And then you have to think, okay, well, lower lobe, I want them kind of face down. It's in the right lobe, so I kind of want them a little bit in left side lying, and that'll help get the stuff going up. Does that make sense? And if it's a very, very basal part of the lobes, that's the uh, child sleeping position. Right? The base at the very bottom of the thing, that was the one where you lay them over the pillow and have them kind of face down on the mat. With, with postural drainage, when I get questions like that, it's just looking at going, okay, where in the lung is it? And how do I position that part of the lung so that the stuff comes out? Did you guys have a specific question on it, or is it just that you didn't remember them? And again, so one thing I want to stress, you may have four questions on your PEAT. It's probably at most going to be one question on your boards. So don't totally freak out on it. All right? So some of these, like, you know, you know, special tests, yeah, you'll probably have more questions on special tests because it's musculoskeletal. But overall, postural drainage is going by the wayside. We're slowly phasing that out because who's doing that now? Primarily respiratory. Right? Dr. Taylor, when was the last time you did postural drainage? I've done postural drainage. There, see? <laughs> Why do you think I've done it? I work with kids. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which book? Uh, We're going backwards. Sorry, third year. Okay. 667, number 118. 667, 118. I'm just wondering if that's the same thing as NMES. I guess it was interchangeable. Let me get your phone. Hold on, let me get there. 118. Patients using portable functional electronics. FES is NMES. Okay. Right, FES, what's the most common FES unit that patients get? We talked about this in neuro with well, foot drop. Starts with a B. The bio nest units. Remember we talked about it? It's the one where when the machine has a pressure sensor in the back that when it's the text of the foot's picked up and all the pressure's relieved off the foot, it dorsiflexes the foot, so when the patient plants down, they have heel strike. Right? Remember I showed you the pictures of those and them working back way back when? Yeah? No? Yeah, FES is basically portable NMES, portable Russian. That makes sense? Okay, cool. Yeah, so whenever you see functional, think neuromuscular. But does that help with postural drainage? Because there's not, I, I'm short of putting Jack in every position and beating him so you can see them all. No. No, I'm not going to do that. I, I think Jack still has nightmares from that day. <laughs> Victor definitely does. <laughs> All right, PNF. What what do you what are we having PNF problems with after the last time we did PNF problems? Because <coughs> last time I covered pretty much the stretching and stuff like that. What problems with PNF are we now having? Is it just the patterns? Is it remembering again which joint is the direction? Which joint determines the direction for PNF patterns? The shoulder and the hip, regardless, right? If I'm coming up with the shoulder, doesn't matter which pattern I'm in, it's a flexion pattern. If I'm going back with the shoulder, doesn't matter what pattern I'm in, it's an extension pattern, right? Even though this kind of looks like a flexion because what's happening at the elbow is a little bit of flexion and that confuses people, this is the extension pattern because if I take my body out of the way, I'm extending the shoulder back here, right? So, D1, flexion pattern. What does it look like for the upper extremity? Starts, it starts in extension and feeds up, right? Then D1 extension pattern starts in flexion and goes down, right? Then D2 flexion pattern starts at the hilt and goes up in the shoulder flexion, whereas the extension pattern starts up here and goes and just puts the sword away, 
right? So then the hip and the leg, right? D1 flexion starts where? Starts out, right? And that's the which one? That's the hacky sack or tire shoe or whatever you want to remember, right? That's, that would be the flexion pattern. That would be the extension pattern. D2 is the hydrant pattern, right? Start across, P on the hydrant. That's the one I can't do because I have absolutely no internal rotation. Um, I don't know, Don, you, you had some questions about this, right? Yeah, can you show the contractor that's been Okay, yeah so, yeah, so we talked about this a little bit last time, right? So what's the difference between contract relax and hold relax? Do you remember what I said? Well, I heard it. Concentric versus isometric, isometric, versus isometric right? Yeah. So hold relax, contract relax. Mm -hmm. Which is my isometric? Hold, relax. hold, right? This is my isometric. This is my isotonic or concentric, right? It's a movement. So that means if I'm doing hold or relax, I'm going to put them at the end of the pattern they're in. I'm going to block them off so they can't move whichever, whether I'm doing agonist or antagonist, doesn't matter which one I'm doing. I'm going to block them so they can't move at all, right? And I'm going to say push whichever direction I want them to push, whether I'm doing the reciprocal inhibition or whether I'm doing muscle spindle activation, right? And I'm not going to let them move. I'm just going to be doing isometric, resist, 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 right? And then contract relax. Instead, I'm going to take them to their end range. I'm going to let them have some movement with their contraction. So, okay, can move back in. So, give me somebody. Come up here, somebody. That way you can at least show. Victor, come on up here. I'm taking notes. Can we see the table? You can see the table. So, lay your head that way. That way? Yeah. Okay. On your back for me. It's going to be easy. Yeah. So remember, I'll be gentle. So hand straight, right? Bend the other knee so you don't, I don't tear you up too much. Right? So I'm going to go up and I'm going to find where his limitation is. So I'm watching him, tell me when it's tight. Right there. Right there. Okay. So now, what is my agonist and what is my antagonist here? Agonist is which muscles? <coughs> Hip flexors. Right? The agonist, the muscle, that's move, would, that muscle that would move him that direction would be his hip flexors. Mm -hmm. The antagonist that's resisting that then would be hamstrings and a little bit also all the glutes, right? The hip extensors. So if I'm doing hold relax, I'm going to get him to this position. And let's just say we're doing antagonist contract. So we're going to contract the hamstrings. I'm going to get him to the position of stretch. I'm going to lock him out. And I'm going to say push down into my shoulder as hard as you can for a 10 count. 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Relax. relax, and I'm going to move him into his new range of motion. That is hold relax. I didn't let you move down. Now contract relax. I'm going to get him up here, and I'm going to tell him, I'm going to have you push down into my hand, but your leg is going to move. So I want you to push me as hard as you can down the path. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and relax. And move him here. And then this time, I don't ever let off. I leave it here. So then I'm going to do it again. Push into my hand. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Relax. And move him further. Oh. <laughs> I broke his knee. I, we're not talking about brokers today. But does that make sense? So hold or relax is just an isometric. You're holding them there. And literally when you do that, you move them into the motion, you hold them there, and that's where they do the next contraction. And each of them, you're not going to let them really come off until they do that concentric contraction. Does that help? OK. Other than that, I'm PNF, OK? Whew. Oh god, the last two. Cardiac and neural meds. All right. What'd you say? They're so similar. They are. Very similar. So cardiac meds, uh, score builders 371, therapy ed 131.
for this one, this particular, this particular thing, I kind of like the therapy edge chart a little bit better. Uh, therapy at 131 and 371 score builders. 131. I like the, I like the chart in score builders a little or therapy at a little bit better than the list in score builders. Does that make because if you look look at the two differences. So score builders is going through each one of them, right? And you got a little bit of a blurb on each of them. Whereas in reality, so score builders was 371 again. Whereas then with therapy ed, it's just a chart and you just have to look at the chart, right? And the chart's a little, because you don't really, you not have to go that far into these meds. You just kind of have to know what they're used for, right? So nitrates, when are nitrates most commonly used? <gasps> I'm having a heart attack, right? Under the tongue typically, right? What is the nitrate going to do? Yeah, so basically what's the nitrate going to do? It's going to do what to the blood vessels? It's going to balloon them, right? What's that going to do to blood pressure? Yeah, why? Because if you got a vessel like this and blood's beating through it at a high rate and all of a sudden you go whoop, right? You got a bigger hose. Pressure's going to go down, all right? So that's the main part of nitrates. It also relieves chest pain because a lot of the chest pain is caused by which are arteries? Your... What ones are around the heart? The coronary arteries, right? Because there's probably a what there? A blockage, right? So if I dilate the vessel, I have a little bit more room to go around the, the blockage and get more blood going to the parts of the heart that are dying, right? And so they're going to give me, so like, I'm going to use myself as an example. When I went to the hospital, the first thing they did to me was slap a patch on my chest full of nitrates. And it sucked. Because one of the biggest things it does is it also dilates all the blood vessels in your head. And what do you think that's going to cause for you? Massive headache. Yeah, because all of a sudden the brain is getting tons of blood. And you think you're going to get really smart, but no, it gives you a massive headache. Right? But the thing is, it'll stop chest pain. It didn't for me. But it would stop chest pain because it actually expands the blood vessels in the heart and allows blood to move a little bit more freely. What that does is that gives the doctors in the ER a little bit of time to figure out... Is it a blockage, and they need to go in and do a stent or something like that, or is it that something's going wrong with my heart that I'm having AFib or VFib, and that's what's causing the problem? And that's a different treatment. Does that make sense? That's what nitrate's primarily used for. And then you may be on a long-term nitrate if you have continuous heart problems, and if you're not at the point, you're kind of that subclinical blockage point, where you're not enough where they have to go in and do surgery yet, but it's still bad enough that it's causing you a little bit of chest pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they'll give you a little subclinical nitrate so that you take it once a day and it dilates those coronary arteries and it makes you feel better. You still got the blockage, but you're not having surgery yet. Does that make sense? And then you have your betas, your calciums, blockers, right? Both of them basically do the same thing, right? They're gonna reduce the demand of the heart by either working on the calcium channels, right? or affect the heart rate and rhythm, right? Your beta andronics are typically your heart rate and rhythm ones. And your calcium channel blockers are usually dealing with the coronary arteries. If I know that I've got a coronary artery problem. So if I'm starting to go into CAD, right? Arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. Right, so when, I, when I'm looking at calcium channel blockers, I'm typically looking for the ZEMs. Yeah, calcium channel blockers typically end in ZEM. Right, and even Procardia is Atlantia ZEM, I think is the actual generic version of it. Don't quote me on that. But it's a ZEM too when you get down to the generic version. Right, the ZEMs are typically your calcium channel blockers. Your beta antrenetics usually are your LOLs or your ROLs. Your propodolol, indorol, stuff like that. Your antiarrhythmics, what are they going to prevent? 
rhythm problems, right? So if you're gonna get a question on that, it's gonna say the patient has some sort of a rhythm problem. That would be the med for that, right? Or they're on this med, it's gonna be a rhythm problem. And usually those are your dines and your mides, I think, isn't that what it is? Yep, look at that. How about that? And then your antihypertensives, they should be really easy for you. What are those used for? Blood pressure. Does that mean that they have a heart problem? Maybe not. Right? Does it mean they could, are going to probably develop a heart problem? Probably. Right? That's why those of you that were in blood pressure with Dr. Chick Telly, and he's like, you've got prehypertension, good to take care of it now so that your heart doesn't die later. Um, the Joxin is pretty rare that you're going to see that, the digitalis drugs. Um, they're, at that point, the patient's already into what? Heart failure. Yeah. Right? Typically, which side? Left. Typically. Aspirin is going to be given to pretty much any patient that has a heart problem. Why? They're going to be given a low dose aspirin. What is aspirin a basic one of? Anticoagulant. It's the most basic anticoagulant we can give. Right, so if we actually take the blood and make it a little less thick, is that going to help pumping? Right. Tranks. Why would we use a trank on a heart patient? Yeah. Right? When I went in, I'm going to use myself as an example again. I went in, and they're like, oh my god, you've got a heart problem. You, thought, you might die. What do you think happened to my heart rate? It went up. What do you think happened to my blood pressure? It went up. Right? And they're like, why is your heart rate so high? You just told me I might die. <laughs> well, no, you might not die today, someday. That'd have been nice to add, right? So they might have to give some form of a trank to these patients to get them kind of a little less out of it, right? And a lot of times they'll use a trank when they're going in and doing the, car the, uh, the ballooning because they don't put them out for that. They just want them kind of in that sedated state, in that twilight state. Lipidemic drugs are for what? Cholesterol. Cholesterol. Good. And then thrombolytics are my, not blood thinners, your anticoagulants and your clot busters. Right? Either of those two. So either of those can be considered thrombolytic in general. Your clot busters are the ones they're going to send when we know that we have a direct clot. Right? Those, what type of patients are we going to send that for primarily? Not necessarily heart attacks, but strokes. Yeah, specifically what type of stroke? Ischemic. ischemic. Good, ischemic. All right, cardiac meds okay? Sure. All right. The main thing, you're not going to get a question, because we don't recommend what drug to give a patient. Right? What our questions are going to be is, your patient is on this drug, what is their likely condition? Right? Or how is it going to affect therapy? So let's look at antihypertensives. Your patient is on an antihypertensive drug. How is that going to affect therapy? So not to say heart rate's not going to be high, low, raised. Blood pressure, right? So now we put them on the treadmill and start with them running. What happens to our blood pressure normally when we start running a little bit? It goes up a little bit because we need more blood going to our extremities. Now, you start this patient that's at a you know, blood pressure of 80 over 40 because they're on antihypertensives. And you put them on that treadmill, and all of a sudden, what's happening to their fingertips and toes, probably? They're turning blue because they're not getting enough blood pressure, enough blood flow out to them, right? And so the body's going to start cordoning off and saying, oh, well, you know, if something's going to die, it's going to be the hand because I don't want the heart to die. Because if the heart dies, well, bigger problems than running, right? And then the rest of them, nitrates, and pretty much all the other heart meds affect heart rate and rhythm. Right, so you're monitoring what? Heart rate, rhythm, right? And what are some of your rhythms? What's, what's the most common rhythm you should have for a patient? Normal, right? Remember we did rate and rhythm, right? Normal, thready, remember some of those, right? So what's it called when it's doing this? Yeah, flutter, right? You're getting the flutter going on. 
So any of those, I mean, any of those drugs can cause those problems, especially the antiarrhythmics, right? They're going to mess with the rhythm of the heart, not the rhythm of the night. Oh, I got to laugh. No. <laughs> but that's the main thing. Don't stress out totally about heart rate meds and stuff like that. It's just mainly how does it affect therapy? And the main thing is you guys are going to be doing what if they're in therapy? Monitoring vital signs. Because they're probably going to do what? Get lightheaded, get dizzy, get nauseated, pass out. What's, that, what's the pre-pass out called? Syncope, right? Get syncopic, where they're kind of, ooh, right? They might present like a vestibular patient, right? I'm feeling dizzy, the room's spinning. In reality, blood's probably not getting where? Brain. That makes sense? Are we okay on cardiac meds? Neuromusculoskeletal meds. What kind of questions are we running into on them? Because this is like the this is the full gambit. This is a ton of stuff, right? The most common meds you're going to run into for musculoskeletal are going to be which two types? Antispastics and muscle relaxers, right? One of them is CNS mediated. One of them is PNS mediated. You remember which ones? But antispastic spasm, where is the spasm occurring at? Spasm is occurring where? In the muscle itself. Right? So typically your antispastic meds are going to work at the muscle level. Whereas the other ones, right, your muscle relaxants, right? What happens when a patient takes a muscle relaxer? Any of you taken them? Yeah. Oh. Right? Old people, they love their scalaxin and their somas. Right? Somas. Any of you saw that when you're on clinicals with patients? Older, Where's my soma? Because guess what the soma does to them? Drool. Right? Because it affects your CNS as well. Antispastics can in a minor amount, but not as much. Antispa What's the main antispastic we deal with? Starts with a B. Baclofen, right? What patients usually are we going to see back on baclofen? Two types. Spinal cord injuries. And kids. What type of kids? Cerebral palsy. Good. All right. And then your, your muscle relaxants are your somas, your flexorals, your scalaxins. All those, right? Um, the the neuro, like, neuro meds and muscle scale meds, I have score builders, 246, therapy ed, and it says 81 or 51. <laughs> I can't read my own handwriting. Might be 51. I don't know, hold on, it might be 81, now that I look at that. Oh, there it is. Starts on 52, yeah, technically. Right? So. Score or therapy ed doesn't break out musculoskeletal and neuro, they kind of combine together, right? And then neuromeds. What, what, kind of, what other neuromeds might you encounter? Yeah, levodopa, right? For which patient? Parkinson's, right? And then what's the other medicine for Parkinson's? Cinnamon, not cinnamon. And cinnamon is L dopa plus carbidopa, right? And then for myasthenia gravis, anti, yeah, anti ACH. I mean, easier to remember it that way. Anti, anti colon and agents, right? Anti ACH, right? But could we use anti ACH medicines on Parkinson's too? You remember we talked about this a little bit in neuro? I just covered this. Why I, this is stuff fresh in my head? Yeah. Right? We could use the anti-ACH meds to reduce our acetylcholine and get a similar effect. But we'd rather than be on the other meds, on the Parkinson's meds. What else? What other problems? We're at 144. I'm starting to get tired. No, just kidding. This is going to be another 15 gig upload. It's okay. I'm testing my new gigabit internet connection at home, so... I have a question on... Anterior, posterior, lateral, capsule. Uh, uh, you know I'm going to point that one to. Just how it affects the 
that what type of room is this? This is a second room. The captain's Yeah, the captain's captain room. It's anterior posterior. Forgot what question it is, but restrictional patterns. Yeah. Yeah. If you move your. Hey, wait, wait. Yeah. You're saying capsular pattern has nothing to do with whether it's the anterior capsule or posterior capsule. I, you're, you're talking about the question about medial rotation and, yeah. and external rotation, yeah, like yeah. what capsule is. So it's like for external rotation and like anterior capsule. Yeah. 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 And then for internal rotation. For that yeah. question? Mm -hmm. That's around the one. Around. Um, oh, oh, the 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 yeah. I think, are you saying which, what stresses the yeah, capsule? Like, Yeah, still roll spin glide. Okay. So, so think of it. Think of it this way. If you you've got your humerus. It's so funny. <laughs> Patrick doesn't gonna smack me as he goes by. <laughs> um, just an, an easy way to think about this is if you've got, if you've got your capsule, kind of attached on either side of the bone. Okay, if I go to stretch that, one side's going to get put on slack and the other side gets stretched. Okay, so which side is going to get stretched? Which is going to be your stress on your capsule? Right, so if I'm, this is the left, so if I laterally rotate, the front side gets stretched, the back side goes on slack. Okay, so it's going to stretch the anterior capsule. If I immediately rotate, it's the opposite. The back side gets stretched, stressing the posterior capsule. I don't know if that was the question, what it was asking. Yeah, it was similar to that, but it's on an abducted 90 degree. It was a dislocation. Yeah. Anterior dislocation. Okay. I have it right here. Um, anterior shoulder dislocation is still like horizontal reduction. Right? That's the question. Yeah. Let's roll spin wide. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's not, it's not, that's it was so wait, what? What? <laughs> I think it was what do you, what motion do you avoid when you have an anterior shoulder dislocation? I just wrote down the answer because it was um, horizontal abduction. Oh yeah, that totally makes sense because you're you're like this, okay. and so if I'm gonna come back, so same thing, I'm stressing the anterior side, right? Because everything in the back gets on slack, so you're pushing it all together. I'm stretching everything in the front. So, the so anterior horizontal anterior. abduction is this one. Right, this is adduction. Right. So it's still the end. So the anterior gets it's stretched. stretched the anterior. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can just, you can just look at it okay. yourself. But yeah. So it's the one, and it's the area that gets pulled in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. What else? That's pretty much it. Pretty sure it's on the peat. I think I've had this question before. Yeah. That's and those. If you get those, honestly, guys, take a screenshot. And send, it's okay to send to us the screenshots. It is not okay to share with each other the screenshots. Does that make sense? Because to send us, you are doing for educational purposes. If you send to each other, yeah, it could be considered cheating, right? So just be aware of that. We can review it with you because we're gonna as soon as we get done with it, what do we think we're gonna do? With it? Keep it. Bridge. Put it in the fridge. Put it on YouTube, Twitter. I don't know. So the retired questions are basically they're not. Yeah. Any yeah. So that's no. So that's what I'm going to go over right now. If we're, if we're done with questions about this stuff, I want to talk about the Pete real quick. Because some of you took the Pete, some of you took the retired Pete, right? So I'm going to give some of you a huge boost of confidence right now. If you took the retired Pete, that is closer to the national boards than any other test you'll take. Because what everyone says, it says at the top of your sheet, the first one. The retired Pete is retired board questions. So there are questions that have been circulated on national boards for long periods of time that are now retired. They can't be used anymore. So those questions are the most correlative to passing your board. So if you scored high on a retired Pete, 
you're pretty real, pretty really, really, really well, really well go, ready to go on the test. Really, really, really good. Good. <laughs> right? The peat, the new academic peat that you guys are taking, that is questions that are almost the board level, but more, they're just that hair smidge away from being ready to go on the national boards. And there's probably a new question on the boards that came off that question that is on the board. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that one's still really highly courted. If you hit score 600 or more on that, probably going to pass your boards, right? You score 650 or better on your retired peak, you're ready. You just can't give up until the end. Does that make sense? You score above 600 on those, you're really ready. You've just got to hit above 600, guys. That's where you have to be. Hit above that 600 threshold, right? Ideally, if I was a person that wanted it, I'd want to be in the 650s. That gives me plenty of room for error, right? But if you're above 600, you're above threshold, right? That's the thing. If you are below 590, these are, anyone that takes a test that is below 590 are the people that we just run into that they come back after the test and say, I got a 598. Because they study, 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 and they end up with 598. Two points off, one question. 599, we had three 599s in January, right? How much would you be kicking yourself right now, right? To, and you'd know that one question, because every single one of them comes out going, oh, that one question I changed, right? And it's probably that one question. There are probably others too, because 599 is not perfect. But that one question is an effect, right? So the retired peat is kind of the hardest of the peats. The peat is still a valid, it's just not as hard as the regular peat. That's, I guess, the second one in the list, I guess, sure. I can't see how you guys have it set up, unfortunately. We see it differently. It's the second one, okay, thank you. Does that make sense though? Mm -hmm. So some of you took the retired Pete, you just went, we're overachievers and took it first. No. Nope, that's fine. That's why we don't say it. We just no. let you go. Take one. Take one. Right, because they're both valid tests. Right, and again, yeah, you score above a 600 on those, you're good to go. That's it, plain and simple. You're good to go if you're above 600. It is, al it's almost, I'm gonna knock on wood, because this is not time to say challenge accepted that if you score above a 600 on the peak, that you're gonna score under a 600 on the national boards, that is not time to challenge except me, right? But usually it's most correlative, right? So the most correlative you know, class that relates to passing your boards is anatomy. Your GPA is directly correlative to passing the boards. If you're a high GPA, you'll probably pass the boards. And then if you score 600 or better on your peak and your repeat, pass the boards. Can't make it any easier than that. Right? You guys all are capable of doing it. You know, some of you may have been down and out with illness and tired and whatever else might be, right? Yeah, you still pass if you're out for me. Some people can. It just depends on what you do for the next three weeks. Yeah, it is. It's just like going to the gym, right? You quit going to the gym for a couple weeks and you go back to the gym and you're like, this sucks. I'm dying, right? But the main thing, again, I want to stress also, on that last day, that day before, somebody take Crystal's books and lock them away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why me? Going on a spot day. Oh, she's going on a spot day, okay. Not allowed to take her books. Yeah. We just, we just don't study that last day, because all it's going to do is mess you up. Go to bed that night, or at least go and lay in your bed if you don't go to bed. <laughs> Stare at the ceiling. i got a big test tomorrow. Right? You guys can do this, right? Have y'all tested the drive down to the Prometric Center yet? No. Please do it. It's down at Eastern and 215. Um, please try, I forget the little road is right there. Pebble, Pebble thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't want a little road Pebble. That makes sense. I don't know. But yes, yeah, so take the drive, seriously, because that way you know, take it when you're going to your test. So if I think you're all pretty much morning, aren't you? No. You're all afternoon. You're all afternoon. <laughs> So drive it at, you know, right when you go because you gotta see what kind of traffic patterns you're gonna hit because you don't wanna be coming in, you know, sweat rolling off your bow, brow because you got there at one second before your test, right? And I'm going to ask this because I, I, previously I had done this. I would typically go down and visit you guys on the day of the test, but I've been told that some people get really nervous when I do that because I had people request it. And then other people threw stuff at me, like tomatoes and 
But no, I just come down and give you a last little pep talk and send you. And some people actually requested that. If, they, if you do not want that, I will not show up that day. And I'll just let you guys email me a week later. Because that'll be about the next time I hear from you. Yeah, I've been there. Not 5.30, but, you know, 7. So, you know, whatever you guys need, just contact us. If there's questions on the Pete that you're not getting, email us, right? If it's musculoskeletal related, you know, you can always email me about it, but you know who your go-to person is for that, right? If it's modalities related, I can help you with that, but again, you know who your go-to person is for that, right? Anything you send me that I don't know, I'm just going to forward to whoever those people are anyway, probably, and have them respond. There's very little that I don't know, though. Just kidding. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything that we can help? Yes. I see a hand going up, Mrs. Isabel. I just have one question. I, I didn't understand why I was getting it wrong. Okay. Um, it's about the ankle brachial All right. Which question number is it? All right, Dr. Tilly. 831 with 39. Oh, that's So I put 65 as my answer, because in the, in the book, it has the little, um, it has like the explanation on 375, and it says from 0 to have if you have those lower values 0 0.35 0 0.55 mm -hmm. they don't even need to exercise it's gonna hurt because they're, okay. they're so limited mm -hmm. but this one brings and you know one a 110 that's gonna be normal so yeah. <coughs> that 0.75 it's enough to notice when you need it so like he's talking about when you start exercising you need that extra blood flow mm -hmm. if you have this issue with your ABI then that's where it's gonna manifest is when right. you start exercising What's, what's your key word on that one? There's two key words. Fairly intense. Oh, okay. Right, those two low values, are they gonna be doing fairly intense? No. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I actually knew that one. I'm impressed. See, I do know everything. <laughs> no, I don't, not even close. All right, anything else? Any other, yes? So Wagner ulcer grade Oh, there's a chart. There's a chart. There right? is? Yeah. yeah. Other systems. Other systems. Yeah. Nope, that's, I was going to say. There's, 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 there's a chart in there. There's a, a, 444. 444, yeah. Thank you. Yep. I was going to say, that was, that was exactly going to be my answer to you, is there's a chart. Yeah. Um, page 672 in therapy number 128. 672 to 128. Floating between my books here. Oops, other way. 672, 128. Cardiac intervention. A patient has recently completed a two week program phase three cardiac rehab and is most likely to demonstrate a decrease in which of the following? All right, so we're in phase three, right? Okay. 672, question 128 in Therapy Ed. Okay. And I understand, so stroke volume is how much is pumped out of the left ventricle. Right, which is going to correlate to? Your ejection fraction. Which is also going to correlate to? Cardiac. Um, your cardiac output. output. But I guess I don't know what happens, like, during exercise, what happens. Right, right. so here's, here's the way I would look at this. If I'm looking at this question and I didn't know the answer to this, okay? I'm looking at this and going, well, three and four are way too close together. They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough that it would cause problems that, uh, you know, getting down to the best answer would probably be a problem. I got it right, but I don't, I wanna know why the other ones are wrong. Okay. Um, so, 
trying to come up with a. I know, you know, the harder. Yeah, so what it's literally saying is, so most likely demonstrate a decrease, and so they're hoping that, what they're saying is, if the patient's in phase three, what are they most likely in a good condition going to demonstrate? Which should be, you know, heart rate at a given submaximal work. There shouldn't actually, you should, that should decrease slightly, meaning that they're getting more physically what? Fit. Fit, right? Right. Uh, do you want them to decrease CO2 elimination? No. What would you want that to happen? We don't want that to increase. That one's, that's the reason why that one's wrong. I think three and four. Like what right. happens to cardiac output and stroke volume when you actually count? Okay, do you, want car do you want that to go down? Let's think about that. Would you want those two to go down? Are they talking about the volume? So it's saying, what's decreasing? What do you, what do you this question is a little bit, what would you, in a cardiac phase three, what would you like to decrease when they're in that phase three phase? Do you want output and volume to decrease from the heart? What would happen? Right, you wouldn't, because what would that mean? They're not getting blood. enough blood, right? Would you want it to be more efficient? So if I change those to efficient cardiac output instead of decreased, yes, we want that, right? But we don't want those two to decrease because that means that there's not enough blood getting out of the body. If it increases, is that a problem? To a point, if it increases to really, really high levels, right? Because if it increases too far, what's going to happen to blood pressure? It's going to shoot through the sky. Right? We're all, we're all going to increase both of those when we're exercising. Okay. Right? We don't want them to, you know, you're going to get this kind of peak and plateau and valley effect when you're exercising. But yeah, so, I mean, there's a couple of them I'm looking at. The main thing is, is I'm looking at that decrease. The only thing I really want to decrease is heart rate. I want them to get more physically fit so that they can do more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any, you have any other additions to that, or is that good? He's good. Anything else? Burn out now? Good, you only got a couple more weeks to burn out. And then just think about it. Then you will be licensed, and then the next burnout can start looking for a job. Um, I have to find out some stuff, evidently, about the rescheduling, because I was informed of some things with the rescheduling. I'll have to call the FS, or the Prometric here in a little bit. I can't call them today because they're already closed. I checked their, well, I was sitting over there checking their thing. They're already closed for the day. So I will find out. It should only be a reschedule fee up till the 29th, but I'll find out. I think it might be the, the exam going up $70 after January. Oh, that might have affected it. I don't know. That might have affected it. That's a quite a possibility. I wonder if they added that addition to a reschedule, too. That would make sense because that would then push it to 120 That might actually be, that might make sense. I'll have to check it. It's 400 after January 1st Yeah. So I'll double check it. I'll take a peek and see what I find out. All right, guys. Done? You free? I'll post this. Like I said, it took, now that I know what I have.